Support for I Am Salt Lake comes from KRCL 90.9, amplifying community voices since 1979. This listener-supported music discovery station covers everything from reggae and punk rock to local grassroots activism. Listen today at 90.9 FM or online at krcl.org. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by Mark Miller Subaru, the Salt Lake Barber Company, and especially for you, your downtown florist. We're going to be telling you more about them throughout this episode. And it is the first episode of July. Happy July, everybody. Happy July, indeed. I can't believe it's July already. I know this year went so fast. Well, I feel like this whole summer is going to disappear. It's crazy. But uh, anyway, let's welcome everybody to the podcast today. My name is Chris Hollifield. And my name's Chrissy Hollifield. And if this is your first time listening to this show, you might be asking yourself what it's all about. Well, this podcast is about showcasing awesome people in Salt Lake City, Utah. We get to talk to musicians, authors, business owners, breweries, distilleries, food truck owners, really anyone that might have a cool story to share. And we're recording today right in beautiful downtown Salt Lake City in our podcast studio that's located in the back of Empire Merchandise. Empire Merchandise is located at 680 South State Street, and not only does Empire have an amazing selection of vape juice and vape accessories, but this is where you can actually come and purchase your very own I Am Salt Lake podcast t-shirt. So make sure to stop on in, check this place out, and grab a t-shirt while you're here. Who's on the podcast today, Chrissy? Today on the podcast, we are joined by Thomas Kreitlow. Thomas is the owner and founder of Pulp Lifestyle Kitchen. We got to find out his story on what motivated him to start Pulp, obstacles that he faced and he overcame when starting Pulp, their menu, and what Pulp is doing to help minimize waste. We're going to be getting into that conversation in just a moment, but before we do, let's give some love to one of our super awesome sponsors, the Salt Lake Barber Company. Hey, full disclosure, this is where I actually go to get my haircuts, my beard trims. Isaac over there, he does a top-notch job always walk out of there feeling like a million bucks. Hey, their address, 10 East, 800 South, right on the corner of 8th and Main. Always plenty of parking, you guys. Head on over to their website, saltlakebarberco.com. Really easy to set up an appointment right there online. You select your barber, you select the services that you want. That way you know what time to go in and look good. Hey, they do take walk-ins if they're available, but saltlakebarberco.com, you get a guaranteed appointment, They offer haircuts, beard trim, straight razor shaves. Again, the Salt Lake Barber Co. They are located 10 East, 800 South, right on the corner of 8th and Main. And many thanks to the Salt Lake Barber Company for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Let's jump into that conversation with Thomas Kreitlow when he came over to our podcast studio to share his story. Thank you so much for listening. Enjoy. Where where were you born and raised? Are you from Salt Lake City area, no. Utah, or where where's home for you? I'm originally from Chicago Heights. I've been I moved out here in the early '80s. Went to high school out here, and then I graduated from high school up north here, 20 miles Clearfield High. What brought you to Utah? Uh, my family relocated here. My my dad was in uh, civil service, so he was a hydraulic tech. He came and worked at Hill Air Force Base. So I came here basically uh, as a transfer. But in your high school days, in my high school, was that tough for you? Uh, relocating to an environment uh, like Utah, like Utah, it can be a little difficult. It was challenging. And we Utah were, in the eighties, yeah, in, in the eighties, and uh, you know, it it was it was uh, learning the culture and and being immersed in the culture was 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 a challenge initially, but it was a great experience for me. Do you get back to Chicago, or you said it's Chicago, right? Or I originally we traveled being in the army and being the in civil service, we traveled out around. Oh, okay. So I lived in Eugene, Oregon. Oh, I lived so in all Tucson, over. Arizona. So I got gotcha. you. Uh, so you were just kind of uprooted all the time. All the time we moved, went to lots of different schools. Uh, it was tough, but it 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 gave me the ability to connect with people very quickly. Something I really appreciated. For all the times that I complained about having to change schools, it really prepared me for being a business owner and being able to connect with all kinds of people. So I was I was grateful for that. And you probably adapt really well to new situations or or things that throw you a curveball. Yeah, you do. Like. You you learn how to you know, you learn how to become comfortable in situations 
that can be uncomfortable for for a person in their teen years, you know. So is pulp your first like entrepreneur endeavor or business, I guess it would be, or restaurant. I mean, what's the story there? Like, have you always been in the food industry or I know I just threw a lot of questions at one time, but how did that happen? Uh, so I, I went to culinary school back in the early nineties. Um, and then out of culinary school, I lived in South Florida and, uh, I loved it, but at the same time, you know, the, the uh, demands of working in a restaurant environment, if you've never done that, can be really, really challenging and uh, it can be draining. Like as a waiter or, uh, or, or in any or capacity, any really impact. long hours. Uh, in Miami, I don't know if you, I, I worked in Miami and I don't know if you've been out there, but it's a whole different culture. And being in the restaurant business, people, you know, they go out, it's a late night and, and uh, people don't really go to bed there at one o'clock. That's really when things get going. So it's not, if like you're working, Utah. <laughs> it's not like Utah. And if you're working 50 or 60 hours a week, and then you're staying out to six, seven o'clock in the morning and you're not, you're not you know, living a balanced lifestyle, that kind of thing can chew you up and spit you out. I've seen a lot, the restaurant business do that to a lot of people. So you were working in Florida in the restaurant yeah. industry. You went to culinary school. But this was way back in the 90s. Yeah, came back to Utah. So it got old for me. You know, I was entering my mid-20s. You know, the, the lifestyle kind of was taking its toll on me. I felt disconnected from my family who, who you know, even though I, I moved away, still lived in Utah. Yeah. I came back in the mid-90s, uh, you know, having culinary school under my belt, having some things under my belt. And then um, just came back to Utah to try it again. And knowing what I had the experience of traveling a little bit, immersing myself in different food cultures, things like that. I came back to Utah and then that's kind of where my, my career kind of where started off. with pulp. Now what, how long has pulp even been? Or is that, is it pulp lifestyle kitchen? I guess is the correct name for pulp, it. pulp lifestyle kitchen is fairly new in my life. So we began in its current state. Now pulp has existed since 2015. It started as a kiosk in the gym at city Creek as just a little smoothie bar. And no kidding. It was, yeah, just a little hobby. A couple of friends and I, uh, we bought it as a place so that we could have a smoothie after we worked out. That's kind of how Pulp started. <laughs> that's so awesome. And that's really how it, uh, it, it's a it's a really funny story. So the um, person who was the director of the RDA at the time, DJ Baxter, he worked out at that gym. And, and so he would come by and talk to me after. And he said, Pulp is, there's something cool about what you've created, even though you didn't really you know, you were just trying to create a little place to have a smoothie, but there's something cool here. Have you ever thought about expanding the concept? We have a location down on Gallivan Avenue that's been vacant, and uh, I think Pulp would really work there. And that's kind of how the conversation started. That's really how the idea came to me. I had thought about a healthy, so kind of the backtrack a little bit, going back, I came back in the nineties and, and uh, you know, the food business, you know, you're eating a lot and, uh, you know, chefs aren't, Oftentimes, chefs aren't really the healthiest people on the block. No. So that was my story. So in the mid 40s, by the time I hit, hit my mid 40s, I'm about 60 pounds heavier than I am now. I weigh 185. So I'm 230, 240. You know, I'm tired. I'm drinking caffeine, energy drinks. I'm doing all these things. As I'm drinking as one As you're of drinking them. one yeah. of those. Yeah. And I'm doing all these things to give myself energy. But ultimately, I'm not living a balanced life. Yeah. What I came back to Utah to do was balance my lifestyle. And I wasn't doing that. I hit 42 and what, what happened was I, I had this kind of personal epiphany where I was like, this way that I'm living and what I'm doing to myself, putting in my, I'm not taking care of myself. I'm not exercising. I'm watching a lot of television. I'm uh, not eating right. I'm not, I'm doing these things that are making me imbalanced and, and un, unhappy. And so I had this kind of epiphany that everything had to change about. I was, you know, 70 pounds heavier. So I made some complete lifestyle changes. Within a year, I, I had been do, I'd done my first triathlon. I, would, I was eating healthy, and my whole life changed. I felt better. My emotional uh, stability was, was better. My spiritual health, I felt like I was more connected to people. All of these things started to change, and it happened simply because I would really started to really look at what I was putting into my body. And n not only food, but ideas, all of these things, they all matter. And so that's really kind of how pulp happened. Pulp happened from turning 42 and saying, this isn't working for yeah. me. And then it basically is about what I'm putting into my body. So I've got to change something and I've got to change my relationship, not only with food, but what, you know, my, my relationship with the world. That's how Pulp started. But the smoothie bar was still going on, but you started eating better before you expanded? Started, yeah. So at this time, I'm, Pulp isn't even in existence yet. 
I re- I'm changing my life. I'm feeling better about who I am. And I realize there's something to that. So the idea of creating, being a food guy, you know, the idea of taking healthy food, making it, first of all, affordable, making it delicious, those ideas began to kind of germinate in my head saying, wait, there's a need for this. Now, what we have is fast food. We have packaged food. We have food that's you know convenient, or we have the other stuff that's expensive. And people are always saying, well, I want to eat healthy. You know, I really do, but I really can't afford it. It's not something that's sustainable for me and my income. So there are all these challenges, especially in an environment like Utah, where people have large families often and they, you know, you got to buy in bulk, yeah, you got to yeah. buy slim price. And, and so the challenge is, is not only to make food healthy for you to taste good, but also to be affordable in an environment where people are really kind of aware of that and, and conscious of it. And I think you've done that at pulp. I mean, I've, I've been there a handful of times. I mean, great prices. I don't know how you do it. I mean, obviously we don't need to give away those secrets, yeah, but I mean, well, we can talk challenge? about those because it, it, it's important. Okay. Okay, so then I talked. I spoke a little bit about the gym. And, yeah, and yeah, yeah. So that's kind of how it all started. But what what I wanted to do early on was I knew that there were things about. So you've probably made a, a juice before. You probably ground up the celery and the yeah, carrots. And I mean, I was your, raised that way. My mom used to growing up. We should get the big bags of carrots yeah. and and put the celery and the parsley and and do all of that. So yeah, I mean, I'm familiar. Yeah. But it's it's time consuming and it's expensive because a lot of those fresh vegetable and fruit drinks take a lot of fresh or fruits and vegetables yeah. to make. Yeah, they do. And if you're not buying in bulk and you're picking up one, you know, you're buying like a couple of pieces of fruit at the store. Yeah, it, it, you're right. It's expensive. <laughs> but one thing that used to make me crazy. So I grew up. First of all. I grew up in the food industry, and so I'm a chef, and I'm always looking for ways to incorporate ingredients to make, you know, the soup. Right? You put everything in the soup, and you, you. So I'm thinking about that. The economist in me is thinking about how to make this food more affordable. But I'm so I'm thinking about one of the things about juice and and all of these ideas turning in my head is I don't. What makes me crazy is people are throwing away all this pulp, right? So they're taking product, they're grinding the juice out of it, and then they're throwing all this wonderful fiber away. It's the best part. So what pulp is, so how the idea started is that we're going to save this juice pulp and we're going to make other stuff out of it. And then by doing that, we become more sustainable and we become more affordable because I can pass that savings on to customers. That's how pulp got its name. It's not just a catchy juice bar name. It's this idea of nothing going to waste. And what lifestyle kitchen means is whatever lifestyle you follow, whether you're vegan, paleo, Whole30, or, or whatever, there's something there at Pulp for you. And it's a sustainable product you can feel good about eating. The juice bar, it was just Pulp, but then when you decided to kind of start carrying food items, is that kind of when you added the it, lifestyle kitchen part to it? That's exactly right. It evolved into Pulp Express. When I really began to think about how to, to expand this model, Yeah. And create more of a, because at that point, it becomes not a place where you and your friends have a smoothie after a workout. It becomes a viable business that requires a business plan. And how are you going to make it work? And that's when the economic guy in me kicks in and says, you know, how is this going to be sustainable? So that's when you're exactly right. That's when it morphed into Pulp Lifestyle Kitchen. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Especially For You, your downtown florist. Especially For You has been located in downtown Salt Lake City for over 33 years. They deliver custom-designed arrangements with fresh, quality flowers, large selections of premium flowers, plants, succulents, orchids, and more. And we recently had a friend, Jimmy Martin, who passed away, and we had to do a celebration of life ceremony. And uh, we were asked to help with arrangements. And I actually reached out to Especially For You, and they were so incredible with helping us figure out which arrangements to get, making sure that they could deliver on a Sunday, which is really unusual out here. And they were just super helpful and friendly. It was a great experience. And super easy to work with. Super easy to work with. They truly love their customers, and they take great pride in delivering unique, beautiful arrangements for any occasions. And the best part, they deliver valley-wide from Draper to Farmington. Stop by and check out their website, yourdowntownflorist.com. They have hip, cool, modern designs. Check it out on their website. You can give them a call, 801-531-7557. 
Go check them out. Support these guys because, like Chrissy said, they were super awesome and easy to work with uh, with Jimmy Martin's uh, funeral. So, And I just want to make a note, too, that I'm usually afraid to call people and talk on the phone. I like to order things online. But when I called these guys, I had a fantastic experience, and they were so kind and helpful. It was actually fun to call them. Many thanks to especially for you, your downtown florist, for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. So City Creek, you just had a little kiosk. Right. And then where did you go? Where did you, where was the first like more Location-ish. cafe restaurant type so deal that you you did? I worked out a deal with the RDA and we opened a space. And uh, so it took us about nine months. So the, it, previously it was on Gallivan Avenue. Okay. So, so just the right Gallivan downtown, Avenue store. Yeah. It used to be a, a little store called Gorilla Bites and they kind of made a run at it. And I, I think that they, yeah. they had their challenges, but we took over for, uh, in that space. And what was really great about it, well, I mean, not that it was great that they didn't succeed, but we, it helped us kind of, because we couldn't afford it, it was just my wife and I. So what we did was we used all the equipment that had been left behind behind by this business that had left. So it made it possible for us to kind of bootstrap the thing by ourselves. And we kind of, you know, we put together the the menu early on. My wife was instrumental in designing. I take all the credit, but the truth <laughs> of the matter is all of the, what you see as far as pulp, the brand, we call it uh, an industrial barn look. And what that is, is like elements of uh, concrete and steel with old wood, re- re- reclaimed fruit walls, wood walls, and stuff like that. And my wife is singly responsible for that. So we kind of came up with this idea of what it would look like, what it would taste like, and what we would charge. And we kind of threw it against the wall. And it was uh, obvious early on that it was going to stick and that people were really digging what they found there. So people were kind of attracted to it from the start. They really? were. I mean, or was there a was there a fear there though? Like, were you scared that maybe you weren't that it was a wrong jump? Yeah, to go from a smoothie so bar to something more. Being a restaurant guy and and being an economist, y- y- the one thing you hear is you know you go into a place that has has failed as a few restaurants, and and the economist to me would t- if I were consulting somebody, I would say, don't go into that place. It's failed as two other restaurants. Yeah, terrible why, location. Why do you think? Yeah, why do you think you're going to be able to go in there and make a work go at it? And so, yeah, there was a lot of fear because not only did was my concept different, and not only was it untested, but but there it was in an environment that had not performed historically for other businesses. So, yeah, a tremendous amount of fear. How many locations do you have now? So we have three. Uh, we I, the one probably, the one by Mountain America. Yeah, we have the one in Sandy, the yeah. one at, at Gallivan downtown, and then we just opened one across the street from Liberty Park on Ninth South. Yeah, and then we've actually just it was just announced we are going into the new terminal at the airport in 2020, which is huge. Because yeah. if you've traveled at all, you oh, know healthy food and it would be and travel so nice. are kind of like they don't really go together. And yeah. We are working also on a concept called Pulp Express that's kind of a more of a grab-and-go, quick serve, and we are opening one uh, in two weeks at the Park City Hospital for IHC, which I think is for pulp is one of the battlegrounds of, of health, right, and healthy eating is hospitals. And airports, right? The two places where you really, You're you should be able to eat healthy, but you really can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, there's basically usually a cafeteria or a subway at a hospital. And To you know, have this option is good. Yeah, yeah. And I think that our mission as a company is aligned with what the hospital is trying to do for, for people and changing their life and diet. There's a few questions. So we have a Facebook group, the I Am Salt Lake Community, which mm-hmm. I urge everybody listening to join. You can just search I Am Salt Lake Community in Facebook and find it. So I threw it out there that we'd be chatting today. Okay. Right? And so, and I was like, well, does anybody have any questions? Is my mom, is there a question for my there, mom? There is. There is. She was wondering. Uh, when am I going to pick up my laundry? Pick up your laundry. No, no. So, well, we have a listener, Brittany. She she threw a bunch of questions down here. So she's first of all, she said this place is so good, like really big cap. So so she loves it as well. The first question she asked, I figured let's jump into these because I figured these might cover a lot of uh, a lot of things. But she wants to know when coming up with a menu, what things did you try that didn't make the menu? I guess so. Did you try some stuff that you just said, yeah, let's scrap this? Yeah, early on we had so. I wanted to become, I, I, I wanted it to feel like a restaurant. And so we had, and it's pretty much a quick serve fast casual. And we had, so we had a section called plates 
And they were kind of like, we, we, so we have a section called wraps and presses and starts and bowls. So we had those. And then we, we had these plates that were entrees. So we had this section of about four of those, three or four of those. And it just, they just didn't work. People were coming in, wanting it on the go, being quick and, um, breakfast, primarily breakfast and lunch. And so this, this dinner portion that was geared toward the dinner crowd, it just didn't go. And so we removed those plates early on. And do you find that? Each location kind of has their specialties, right? Like more people are ordering this at the Sandy one, more people are ordering this at the, at the Gallivan one or, you know, you know what I mean? Like, do you find that something sell better at one location over another? So not really. Not and really. It's funny. We do have different customers. Um, some things will, uh, but the most, for the most part, the three main things that uh, our biggest sellers are the bowls and we do the Sano bowl the the uh, Uma Bowl and the Chica Bowl. And those are three different flavor profiles, but those by and large, they account for about 30% of all of our sales. Another question that uh, Brittany wants to know here is if you could open up a sister, more formal restaurant, what kind of food would you serve? Or have you put any thought? I don't know. Maybe you haven't even put any thought. So no, we actually, I've actually thought about this because um, I think there's a space there's there's a void in the market for this kind of thing. And I think that Zest, they do a really yeah. good job downtown. And, Delicious, uh, yeah. They have kind of a full service kind of thing. And I think with what we do with the quick surf, fast casual, there's kind of a place in between those. And um, I would do, I would jump back to a little bit more of those things. Like I'd, I would go to, with more of uh, small plates and those kinds of things, tapas and moosh moosh, healthy stuff like that, that could be more conversational uh, where people would maybe the dining experience would be not 30 minutes, but 45 minutes. You'd have some tapas. Maybe you could come up with some craft cocktails or, or something like that that involved cold pressed juice or the, some of the other things and kind of blend that upper scale dining with uh, with the quick serve model and kind of kind of mesh those together. So I have thought about it and I think it would be a little bit more of those organized kind of composed dishes. Do you have a liquor license at Pulp now? Or? No. Because you mentioned cocktails. So that's what nope, I was curious. No, I think that we've talked a lot about this and, yeah. and uh, I think it's, it's in direct conflict with what our mission is yeah. mm-hmm. as Pulp. And so- We've decided that I think it would feel a little like trying to exploit something in the market for us to try to sell a glass of wine or beer when we have all of this juice and everything. And trying so, to be healthy. Yeah. You're trying to be healthy. And I think it would seem a little mercenary for me, like just to try to sell a drink, just to ha- offer that. So we never have gone down that road. And no, we don't have a liquor license. But if I did do a step up from that, I think I, it would be something. That I got you. Yeah. I was just curious if if currently now you did, you know, yeah. you just, uh, um, I'm kind of taking over here with these questions from mm-hmm. Brittany, but uh, the next question she she has a bunch here. Let's see. Uh, what is a food trend that annoys you or is overrated? Uh, wow, that's a really good question. I'll tell you that here's one that we had to change. So a couple of years ago, everyone was saying coconut oil, coconut oil, and it was the big rage. And um, you know, it's funny that you know, companies can market things really well. And, and then you can think that there are all kinds of health benefits for it. And we, we used it quite a bit for cooking. The coconut oil. Coconut oil. And we found out that it's actually, when you, when you heat it, it actually has a trouble breaking down in your system and it's actually counterproductive for the whole process. So we ended up going to a rice plant brand oil, which is the, one of the healthiest oils you can get highest smoke point temperature and everything like that. So we that was just one example of kind of the evolution of, and we're constantly always looking at that. What what was healthy two years ago sometimes isn't healthy two years later. Oh, absolutely. Coconut oil is one of those things. And so we're always, we're always keeping our eye out for, for that kind of thing. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Mark Miller Subaru. In true Subaru fashion, Mark Miller Subaru isn't afraid to take the road less traveled. That's why Mark Miller Subaru is honored to be Utah's only negotiation-free Subaru retailer. Mark Miller Subaru's exclusive negotiation-free program is called Promise Price. All vehicles sold at Mark Miller Subaru are competitively priced, so their customers know what they are getting for an exceptional deal. Everyone, regardless of who you know, you're going to pay the exact same price. The price you see is the price you pay. Mark Miller Subaru is committed to revolutionizing the car buying experience by offering people a transparent, competitive, and honest price up front. 
Mark Miller Subaru can focus on providing their guests with a fun and memorable experience instead of one of those tainted negotiations. And Mark Miller Subaru has two convenient locations that you can visit. They have Mark Miller Subaru Midtown, which is at 3535 South State Street in Salt Lake City. This is the one that Chris and I actually use for our personal Subaru. Or you could visit Mark Miller Subaru Southtown, 10920 State Street in Sandy. Hey, go test drive a Subaru today. I think Chrissy and I know already that you're going to love it because we couldn't imagine living here in Utah without our Subaru. It's gotten us out of some sticky situations, you guys, between the snow and the rain. You need a Subaru for this, you guys. Again, go visit them in their Midtown or their Southtown locations. And many thanks to Mark Miller Subaru for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Another question from her is, if cost profit wasn't a concern, what would you add to your menu? I think we already kind of do that. Yeah. And um, the way that we bring down the cost in, from, from what normal restaurants kind of use as a, as a formula for that is to reuse the pulp and do some other things. We are our own vertical supplier. So we, we actually make all of the stuff. So instead of buying a veggie burger, we actually make the veggie patties ourselves using some of the juice pulp. Really? So yeah. Which is yeah. so cool. Yeah. And so we, we were able to provide that at a lower cost. We make it at our commissary on 9th South, and then we sell it to ourselves at all of our stores so we're able to keep the cost down. Pulp was never started to be something we scaled. It's worked out really well. We've been approached from markets all over the com- country, but we never really did it to make money. We started it, 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 was start, it started because this whole idea of, of being healthy and, and changing your life changed my life, and I, I wanted people to experience that. This is a question here from, from Brittany, and I'm kind of curious too. What is your favorite menu item? So I've been really trying to kind of watch carbs and kind of, you know, not that I'm like a, one of those crazy no carb kind of people, but my favorite bowl. So the people that come to Pulp, they usually start having the Sano bowl and it's kind of like a progression. They'll try the Chica and the Uma. They're all different flavor profiles, but my favorite is the Kachi bowl. The Kachi is shredded spaghetti squash, tomatoes, uh, fresh herbs, shallots, garlic, olive oil. And then we make turkey meatballs. And instead of putting a filler in the turkey meatballs, we put the juice pulp in there. So it's the kachi with turkey meatballs. It's like 320 calories. It's delicious. Wow. So you really do get in there and reuse the stuff yeah. and, and put it in. Oh, okay. That's- Which is so cool. Cause I, I went through a phase where I juiced multiple times a day and I was like really into drinking juice and I wanted to do something with the pulp, but yeah. I could never be creative enough to actually figure out what to do with it. It's frustrating, and it's always right? Depressed You're like me throwing that, all that away. Yeah, it's, it's really sad. We got really creative. And so we make five varieties of kale chips and we, we dehydrate them. And you we make sell. them. They're available make- at the Broadway Cinema. They're available at certain locations. So we make the kale chips. We make a cashew ranch one that's vegan and gluten-free. It's delicious. But we use the almond pulp left over from making almond milk because I'm like, I can't throw away this almond pulp. It's crazy. I've got to develop a recipe because it's driving me crazy. So we use, so we just, we're always looking for ways. Well, wow, so you, you even make your own almond milk. I'll make, like, we make our own almond milk. Wow. This guy's a genius. Over I here. know. I want to eat there all the time now. Hey, so I'm, I'm sure you get like requests, right? From customers? Constantly. You, what's the oddest request you've ever gotten? Uh, you know, I will tell you that, and I hope if anyone's listening, they're not a fit. So we, every year there's a, um, there's a convention here. It's the essential oil folks. They come to town li- and they're great for us. It's when our town smells like lavender, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can, it's, uh, or, or patchouli, yeah, depending on yeah. where you go. And, uh, so it's really, they're really wonderful and they really support what I do very robustly. But one of the things about them is, is they have a million requests, requests, dietary restrictions. And so we get, gosh, we get a lot of different ones, but I think that, uh, I, I, I don't know. Just can, more like, like dietary, can, like yeah. make sure to not have can peanuts you, in there. Yeah. Or, and or, can you, can you take, you know, something out? Can you take the tomato out and add kale or can you, you know, uh, does that upset you as a, as like a, as like a business owner, as a no, food owner? Cause I've never no. understood restaurants that don't let you do that. It's like, here's the thing. And if you go, Chris, if you go to the Gallivan store, especially where there's a lunch crowd, anybody, if you read our reviews, people will tell you that one of the things they love about pulp. It, so other models, you guys travel, oh, you guys get out, you know, yeah, sure. so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so like, so, so say cafe Rio or one of those models where they kind of build it in front of you. One of the things that you can't customize a lot of that because it's already prepared, you can build it, 
but you've got to pick what they've already have available. The thing that's great about pulp is we make everything fresh. So if you want to leave kale out, you black beans don't work for you in your sauna bowl. Uh, you want to add extra sweet potato for that. You want to add, so our bowls come with a base of brown rice, quinoa, or pulp hash. If you want to mix half quinoa, half pulp hash, like all of anybody who's a loyal pulp customer will tell you, we're totally cool with that. And we don't make a big deal out of it. And that's one of the things that's really wonderful about our model is that we're set up to do that for you because it's not pre-cooked. What do you know now doing everything you've done? I mean, you've been around for a couple of years that you wished you would have known when you started all this. I wish I would have, um, gosh, that's a tough one. I, I probably would have you know, honestly, I don't know that I would have done anything differently. I think that I would have, honestly, I probably would have, Sandy was our second location. And I think I probably would have opened, I would have grown in concentric circles outside from the downtown area out. So I probably, our second location, instead of a third location being Liberty, it probably would have been Liberty would have probably been number two. Then we would probably would have went to Mill Creek. Then we probably would have went to Murray and then ended up out in, you know, store number four or five would have been Sandy because it, it has been a challenge out there getting uh, to working in an environment or, or having a, being a local business owner in an environment that s- supports a lot of chain restaurants. Mm-hmm. It, 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 we are making a lot of headway now, but for the first year, it was really challenging getting people to see the value of what we were doing and getting them to kind of think sure. outside of the box and break their routine with going to where wherever they were going. So I think I would have just expanded differently, but I don't think the model would have been any different. Honestly, we we've been we feel like we've kind of hit it on the head and we've figured out a lot of things. Do you plan on like expanding more Provo, Ogden, St. George, even out outside of Utah? We have been approached a lot by other, so people will come to Salt Lake for conventions. There's a guy who came here from Louisiana. He calls me every six months. Are you ready? I'm ready to do three stores. And oh, wow. I'm like, well, if anyone needs healthy food, it's New Orleans. I've been there. <laughs> but, but, uh, and same with the, there's a, there's a physician in Boise. There's a group of doctors in Minneapolis. So I think we will get there. I think the airport will create a lot of opportunity with regard to that. Um, but we do have plans. We're growing this new model, Pulp Express, and then we're also getting ready to release our juice in retail outlets. So we we are embracing a new technology called HPP, which is cold press, which is really, if I can take 20 seconds to no, tell no, what it is. Yeah, yeah. You can take more than that. You so can. if you want to, okay, so back in 1996, there was a problem with Old Walla. They, they, they were the one juice company that was out and they they got a lot of people sick. They weren't pasteurizing their juice. And so uh, like 20 people got really sick. Some of them died. And this was in 96. So the FDA stepped in. They said, no one wholesales juice anymore unless it gets pasteurized. Well, there's a problem with that because if you use heat to pasteurize fresh vegetable juice, right, it kills it. It kills yeah. all the nutritional value, kills the juice. So you, you there's this catch 22 where you can't pasteurize. You can't sell it on wholesale, but you have to pasteurize it. You can't pasteurize it because it actually defeats the whole purpose of what you were trying to do to begin with. Well, there's this new technology. It's been around for about 15 years. It's called HPP, where they actually you actually bottle the juice, cap it, and you actually put it in this drum that's about, imagine like a battleship gun barrel. It's really thick. You cap the ends of it, and then you use these high-pressure pumps, pumps to inject 87,000 pounds of water. What the cold water does is it presses the juice and creates such pressure that it kills all the bacteria and makes the product safe without harming the nutritional value of the integrity of the product. So we are getting ready to embrace that technology here. And that technology is revolution, revolutionizing the food industry because there was just a report out saying one of six people will get one in six people will get a foodborne illness this year. So pulp is at the front wow. edge of that. We're going to start HPPing our juice, making it available. Like we used to carry it in public coffee and a few other local people's coffee. And so we're getting ready to kind of do that expand. And we're also working on uh, developing five uh, flavors of what we feel will replace yogurt. Yogurt and dairy made from cow's milk is a problem because there's a lot of kind of press about how the cows harm the environment, methane and animal treatment and everything. So we're making chia pudding with uh, coconut milk that has all of the healthful benefits of, of yogurt for your gut without the dairy. So we're getting ready to finalize the recipes for five of those and release those too. So we're, we, we will always do what we're doing with regard to restaurants, but we're trying to grow into a little bit some, to some of the more mainstream food industry and supply so that we feel like we can affect 
more people with what we're trying to do as far as positive outcomes with their life and food and eating. So would you sell that? Like you said, chia pudding, right? Yeah. Like, would you sell that at different places? Like you mentioned public coffee and, yeah. and what? And we're actually talking to a major grocery retailer too, ah. to make that available because they agree with us that food should be headed in this direction. So I think companies are starting to understand that there's an opportunity here to help people better their life through food. And it's not about, you know, just whatever's cheapest or what, whatever's available. It's about what's best for, for the consumer. I like that as a society, we're finally kind of starting to get back there. I feel like starting in the 60s, we, we made this movement to like make everything fast and last forever. And it just kind of got out of control. Yeah. And now we're like, oh crap, we're, we're killing ourselves. So let's go back and try to eat actual food, you know, instead of cheese product or, you know, whatever, yeah. whatever is in the store that can last on the shelf for like 12 weeks. And we can have a discussion probably for another podcast, but there's an opportunity. So early on being a young, a father of a young child, I know you are too, but yeah. you know, my concern is that, you know, what I'm seeing is, is that children don't really have the choice. And so what I see, what I would love, like Pulp does really well downtown and in Sandy and, and by, by Liberty Park, and it would probably do well on the east side. But where I'd love to see Pulp make it is like Magna or West Valley, where there's an opportunity to compete with some of this stuff that is just not healthy for children because it's it's basically an economic thing where fast food is made affordable, and so mm-hmm. it's what's what's available. I would like to get in there and compete with those models and say, listen, you know, this is competitive from a price standpoint and it's a lot better for you. I, I hope that if it's not us, somebody gets to the point where they're able to, to change because I think there's a real opportunity with young people right now. There's an epidemic, you guys know. When you started all this, did you, you never imagined it would be like this? No, I didn't. I thought that there was an opportunity, but I didn't think that we would be, uh, that the, the feedback would be so positive and that we'd be able to really kind of help people. Are, are you still working out of any of the locations? Or are you kind of in the offices now or, or how is that working out? No, I'm still it? in the trenches. I, I'm not as much as I used to be. Uh, I have a wonderful well, crew and I'm more in developing the business end of it, working on recipes, working on processes, working on new locations, working on systems that ensure that the, the product you get in Sandy is the same product you're getting at Gallivan. As you grow, those kinds of things become paramount in order to grow. So I'm still around. As a business owner, is it hard for you to have, like for me, I'm the type of person where it's like, I kind of want control of things, right? Where, mm-hmm. so it's like to delegate and to have somebody else work on something of mine and maybe I'm not present. Like, I'm wondering if that's difficult for you, right? Like you, you're, you're leaving all these locations alone and you're not there and you're not, uh, you, I don't know. You have to rely on the competency yeah, of others and yeah, the fact that, you know, the and, and that's hard for through. some business owners. I was just wondering how that is for you. You know, I've had to do things earlier in my life that required me letting go of certain things. And so I have been uh, well prepared for that. Uh, Pulp, I don't call it my baby because I think if you do that, it, it kind of means that, you know, you'll have trouble kind of being able to separate yourself from from uh, what's best for your company based on your own personal ego. I've been really fortunate to be able to do that. Uh, I've, I've uh, hired well, I've developed well, and uh, I don't worry about that anymore. I don't worry about us staying on brand and staying on a mission because I think the people that work for me understand we, you know, what they, you they buy into yeah. it too. I mean, it's not just a job yeah. and, you know, we, we, we want people there that believe in what we're doing. And so we've been fortunate enough to find those people. And so I, I, I trust that the process will continue without me if it needs to. Is that a fear, though, in the future, if you actually start to franchise even outside of the state, that you might lose some quality control? Or, you know, how, do you, how are you feeling about that? Yeah, I, I worry about that. Uh, I think that that's been one of the roadblocks to really robu- kind of pushing the whole franchise thing is just the, the, and I think we're still working on some things internally to get it just right. Some menu revision. We, we recently tried a dinner menu and, and, uh, some of the things were executed well. Some of the things didn't end up being executed as well as we'd liked. And so now we're going back to the drawing board and saying, is that really our, our space dinner? And, and so, so we're still we're still getting we're still working it out and we're still understanding things and I think we'll get to the point where we're going to say okay great I think we've got it figured out the airport's online Park City's online this new model's online now we can look at taking this to other markets and letting people in Denver or Boise experience what we've been fortunate enough to create here in Salt Lake City 
awesome. What advice would you give? We get a lot of business owners, right? That, mm-hmm. that are listening to the show. Maybe not necessarily even in the food industry, just business owners in general. Somebody's opening up, say, let's say somebody's opening up a business. Uh-huh. What advice would you give them? I don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> no. Uh, no. I would say make sure you surround yourself with with the right people once that time comes. But I would also say make sure you understand you have realistic expectations about what it's going to take. People see what Pulp has become, but for the first year, at the time my wife was pregnant with my son and we were working from six in the morning to 10 at night and, and there were days where we were just like, gosh, I don't think I can do this for another day. So know that those things are going to happen. And understand this, that actually that's a really good thing because I think that if if that happens to you and you can make it through that, then the hard part's over for you because that's the breaking, that's the tipping point for a lot of people in the first six or eight months. A lot of restaurants go out of business because they don't, they don't understand that that's coming. And it doesn't matter how much money you have from, from financial backers or how much, how, how great your model is. Something is going to be a variable that you can't control. It could be, uh, uh, it could be a changing labor market. You know, unemployment's really low and, and, and it's hard to find people for the restaurant industry. But my advice is have realistic expectations about what the first year is going to look like. And then understand that this is not a quick, it's not a quick ride. Like this is something that you're in, you're in it for a long time. And the best thing that can happen for you is to face that kind of adversity because it will test your brand and you'll come through the other side with a proven concept that you can, you can grow and expand. When you're not working at the restaurant, just to get a chance to get to know who Thomas is a little bit, like what, what are some of your other hobbies and interests? I mean, obviously health and exercise, fitness is important to you, but what else is important? So being, being a father, I have a, a three-year-old little boy named Luca, and so, and I'm older. I'm in my fifties, and so I have a daughter that just graduated college, and so having, you know, that experience when I was in my thirties, and then having this experience now, being a little older, has been really cathartic for me. I'm more patient. I just, it's just been really a blessing for me to have this little boy in my life. I have a wonderful marriage, so those things are what I'm working on. Family. I'm trying not to lose myself. Because remember, Chris, I started this whole thing to create balance for myself. And sometimes what you want is what actually becomes your undoing. And I don't want Pulp's success to be my undoing. And so I really try to still exercise. I try to still do the things that give me that balance. And and being with my little boy is is one of those things. Uh, Exercising outside is one of those things. Giving back to the community in some ways is one of those things. And so now, didn't you say you did a marathon or something in the beginning? Too? I did, Are you yeah. still doing those? Or no? I haven't done a triathlon or for triathlon, a few yeah. years. Yeah, uh, you're a parent of a young child, <laughs> you know, and you're busy. And oh, you don't so, do anything for a few years. Yeah, yeah. yeah you like, don't. I'm getting to the point now where he's going to start preschool, and and uh, so I'm excited about that and having a little more free time, but. You know, it's one of those things. You know that your, your first three years of your life are so tri- triathlons and and like long distance road races kind of went on the back burner, but they'll come back, and that, that's what I'm trying to reintegrate into my life right now. A few uh, we ask a few Salt Lake City related questions on the podcast. Okay, uh, a few standard questions that we ask people that come through here. We all have friends or family members that come visit us here. Maybe they've never been here. Do you have anything that you tell them? You got to go check this out. You got to do this. I mean, it could be anything from a building to a hike in the mountains, to a camp yeah. out, to a the Salt Lake. I don't know. I didn't yeah. know if you have anything that you tell people. It's funny that you ask me this because I actually created a template for my managers to ask questions during interviews. And one of the questions I have my managers ask potential employees is, if your family came to visit you here, where would you take them? There and you go. What what would you, it tells you a lot about an individual, uh, an individual where they would take somebody. So my answer to that is it depends a little bit on the individual, but I always, I always go up to the canyon. I love to go up to City Creek. I take people up to City Creek because it's close enough or, you know, up to Donut or something like that. It's close enough where you can park and it's not a whole day. But I do that. I always take people up to Park City in that area because they, it seems it's like an old mining town. You can go down to Main Street. I think those are great. I usually try to take somebody, if there's, if there's live music, I usually try to take people to see a live show of some kind because we have a lot of great little venues here. We do. And there's yeah. really a great music scene here. People, I mean, a lot of people know, but there are a lot of people who don't know. So I try to catch something live, you know, so those are the things I try to do. What would you change about Salt Lake City 
if you could, or would you not nothing? I don't know. Maybe not. I think Salt Lake has done a really great job of getting ahead of the curve with regard. So I travel a lot. I did a lot of traveling to look at the model of pulp. And I went to like the Bay Area and, and Los Angeles. I went to Phoenix. I went over to the East Coast. But one thing they've done here, city planning has been really great because they've really stayed ahead of the mass transit. So, and, and also the city's cleanliness. Like if you go to the Bay Area and you're walking over by Mission or something like that, it's really, you know, nothing against the Bay Area, but it's a little dirtier than Salt Lake City. They've done a great job of keeping Salt Lake clean. They've done a great job of keeping it safe and they, you, they can get you around the valley pretty easily. Honestly, I don't, I think the one thing that's the, the thing that we need to work on collectively as the society here, as, as the, the population of Salt Lake, is the pollution, the inversion. <laughs> Any ideas on how to fix that? I don't. I, that's I, the tough part. That is the tough part. I don't know that there's a solution. Uh, Maybe drive a little less, I guess. Well, and we have a great mass transit system. I think we collectively, maybe we need to kind of uh, create a better uh, bike-friendly environment. Maybe, I mean, we've come a long way with regard to that. The, the city bikes, the green bikes are here. Uh, the, you know, there's more bike lanes. I think we need to look at that, look at what some of the other cities are doing. It's funny to me, like you can go to New York and you can walk 10 blocks to go to a restaurant if you're staying in a hotel. But it's funny here, people people are like, oh, I'm staying on 2nd South and I, there's something on 5th South and I'm not going to walk. Like they'll drive their mm-hmm. car. It's like three blocks here is like the, it's like the cutting, the, the cutoff. You know, you're like. Wonder why that, why, why do you think that is? I, I, I think the perception is different here, I, and I don't have an answer for you. And they're but, huge blocks too, so I well, think it, bigger, it feels yeah. a little bit more overwhelming to walk one block here than one block somewhere else. Yeah, maybe, maybe it, that's the case. Yeah, yeah, the blocks are bigger, but I think we have to get outside of that because mm-hmm. it's funny. You know, I think that we could get around a little bit better walking as parking becomes more scarce, and we're seeing all the development going on downtown. I think we really need to look at ways to get people around and get the pollution level down, especially in the winter. Well, you know, it's funny you say that because I hear you, you mentioned parking. I hear that all the time. Oh, parking's so bad downtown. It's like, how is it bad downtown? Like, I've never had a hard time finding a parking place. And then if you do, walk a block or two if, yeah. you, if, if you have to. It's not the it's end of the world. It's because we all want to park right in front of the door. Yeah. I, well, yeah. if you don't park next to the door, then then you're a bad person or something. I yeah. agree with you. Yeah. It's not bad. I'm saying, but as we expand. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, look how many cranes, look how many apartment buildings are going up. Look how many more are going up. I, the situation yeah. will get worse. And, True. And uh, I think that that's kind of, we have an opportunity now. We're at a place where we can make some decisions uh, and change some things and get to that point without it adversely affecting when we do reach that point where, cause it's happening. Well, the traffic, oh, yeah. I mean, anytime you go anywhere two yeah. in the afternoon, you try to go to the yeah. South end of the Valley and you're in a traffic yeah. jam. It you, used to just be rush hour. You're yeah. right now. It's It'd be like, all right, I'm going to avoid going to Ikea at five o'clock, <laughs> right? Like just cause you didn't want to drive down to Draper exactly. and, and get caught in the traffic. And now and, it doesn't matter. Now it yeah, doesn't. doesn't matter. But yet then like last night we drove down to uh, what Sandy at yeah. six o'clock on a, on a, on a Friday on, night, Friday, Saturday night, whatever what, night it was. Saturday? It was know. empty. Yeah. Go figure. Like how, how does that work yeah. out? I don't know. But um, this is a fun question to ask people in the food industry. People that come through, I ask them, you know, favorite local eating spots. Like I mentioned when we had Maddie, on, Maddie Mink on the podcast, you mentioned pulp, you know? Mm-hmm. What what about yourself? Do you have any favorite other favorite local eating spots that that Thomas likes to eat at, or if maybe you don't, I don't know. So I'll I'll be honest with you. Um, we do have a couple. Uh, you, you, as as the father of a young child, you know, a lot of times that's that's decided for you, right? Oh yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, but when it's just my wife and I, we do like sushi. So we will treat ourselves to sushi. I'll be honest with you. I'm not perfect. I'll go eat. I'll go to Celebello and eat a whole pizza by myself about no. once every three months. That's, That's a good wrong. pizza, though. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. And uh, sometimes we'll have a date night and we'll go up and we'll look at like home goods or something in uh, Farmington. And we'll just go by Harmon's and make a salad in their salad bar. I know that that sounds Oh, like, man. Their no. salad bar is good. Yeah. It I mean, is. they do a good job. And and uh, And so it just depends on how much time we have. But we do have a couple of... Uh, a couple of local spots we really love. We're friends with the with Mai and Sapa, the Sapa group. And so, I mean, you can't, I love Sapa and we go there, you know, we used to go there more, but we go there and we go there. They have fat fish up by our house. I live in uh, Bountiful. So there's a fat fish up there. And so we'll get sushi up there, but it's mainly sushi and, well, you got Chrissy smiling. She loves sushi. I know. I want to eat sushi right now. I like sushi too. I just never really got crazy about it like a lot of people did. I mean, I'll eat some, but it's not. Oh man, it's, it's the not best. Too. Yeah. Now, as we kind of as we kind of wrap this up here, I mean, I know we just skimmed the surface today, Thomas. I mean, yeah. we could. 
definitely dive deep. And I mean, you even made a few comments like this could be another podcast for another day. But is there anything that you were hoping that we would talk about or ask you that I haven't brought up yet? I would like to talk about, we talked about sustainability with food yeah. waste. Pulp has co- uh, is kind of uh, committed to zero uh, use, single use plastic. And I feel like that's, that's an area that as we look to package things, as we look to make things uh, easy for people to get and carry and leave with, as we, as we, you know, because that's really what it's all about now. That's what I am. Amazon's teaching us and all. It's all about convenience. Mm-hmm. As we become more convenient as a society, we have to make sure that the thing that we're trying to do doesn't hurt the thing that we're trying to avoid. And and like I was talking about a minute ago, so pulp is kind of committed to zero single use plastic. We're really using what's called PLA, which is polylactic acid. Basically it's corn. So if you get a smoothie at our, any of our stores and it's the pulp cup, you can actually put that in your window and it'll disintegrate. So the cup, will? the cup will. So if it gets warm, if it gets over 90 degrees, it'll melt into itself. It's just corn. It's just corn. And if you put it in a landfill, it'll break down within 200 days. We are going to polylactic acid because even if you recycle plastic now, other places that take recycled plastic are not taking it. China can't process it anymore. There are things like that. So even the best intentions don't really you know, solve the problem that they're trying to solve. And so we're going to, even in our juice bottles, we're going to go to PLA, which breaks down in 200 days. We, we, don't, we don't want to make people's lives better with healthy food and make the planet worse off. And so that's one of the things that Pulp's really striving for. And I really think all businesses need to take a look at that on their impact on the environment. Why aren't they, do you think? Is it, is it expense? Is it expensive? It's not economically smart to do so. It's it, it, a bottle, a juice bottle can be a dime more expensive. It doesn't sound like a lot, but when but you're doing yeah. 10,000 bottles a week, Definitely adds up. And over the course of a year, that's $50,000. $50, and so that's a big, big thing. And so, you know, it, and it's really funny. People want to do what's great for the environment, but if the price goes up 25 Five cents. Everyone's like, "What? Oh my goodness!" You know, you got really got to justify that, mm-hmm. and so you've got to find a way to build that into your pricing strategy that doesn't really affect people. When your goal is to provide affordable, healthy food, so you have to try to make all that work in an algorithm or an equation that makes sense for everybody, so people don't feel like you're trying to gouge them because you're on some social mission. It's a tough balance to strike because I think people think you're trying to make a quick buck if you have to raise prices yeah. as opposed to, oh, you're trying to do something that is environmentally friendly and just better all around for everybody. Right. But, you know, we, we kind of tend to be selfish at the end of the day. Like, yeah. oh, that's my quarter. I think you will see more businesses probably doing this though yeah. as, as time goes on. I mean, this is a horrible food example, but I'm sure we all remember when McDonald's had the horrible styrofoam <laughs> hamburger oh, yeah. containers. Yeah. And I mean, that was a common thing i mean yeah. that was well, i mean mcdonald's probably wasn't the only one i mean it probably all the fast food places yeah. had that and that was common and then we kind of you know hey this is stupid of us to do this and so we we progress right yeah. and uh, i think that maybe hopefully even maybe laws will go into place that businesses will have to be more sustainable uh with waste yeah uh with with their products Run down the list of the locations again, just for our listeners. Uh, and if you have the exact address, even, I mean, maybe, I don't even know if you, you probably have it memorized. I, I do. Yeah. I do. So we, our first location, our original location uh, is at 49 Gallivan Avenue. Okay. And Gallivan's that little side street that runs between second and third South between state and Maine. It's like a little cobblestone deal. Isn't you know? from scratch right down there, right? Yeah, from yes. scratch is yeah. there, both cutters there. The, uh, there's, uh, you know, there's two, two news is right there. You yeah. Yeah. So we are right there on Gallivan Avenue. That was our flagship store. We have the location at Sandy at 9645 South State, right by the Expo. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we just opened Liberty Park, which is 439 East, 900 South. That's also our production facility uh, and our corporate office. And then we have a new location opening, a smaller location opening up in Park City at the Park City Hospital. It's, uh, I can't remember the address for that. And then the... um, the airport will be opening in Terminal One. Pulp will be at Terminal One in the new in the new airport in 2020 in August of 2020. So that's where we're headed. What about website? Do you have a website? We do pulplifestylekitchen.com, and then we're pulp we're at pulp lifestyle on Instagram and Facebook. And I'll put all those links at IamSaltLake.com with this episode as well. So in case you're driving, you can't get those. I'll put the address up uh, for Pulp as well on there. Uh, I've had a great time. 
Thank you. Getting to know you today, Thomas. Uh, yeah, I feel like I've learned a ton. Too. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. You you just kind of been sitting over there. I've like just been absorbing, absorbing. I know. all of it. I love um, it. Chrissy has a final question that she throws out at everybody. Uh, I'll let her in the conversation. Like I said, though, Thomas, uh, it's been great, great chatting with you. Thank today. you for having me. I've had a, I've had a good time. It's today. been really You're awesome. Back. Could you actually leave our listeners with one piece of life advice or a motto that you live by? I think the one thing that I would say is that there are no shortcuts. That anything worthwhile is worth working for, fighting for, and if it comes easy, then it has no value. And so I, I would just, you know, my my parting point piece of advice was it would be there are no shortcuts. Do it the right way. Take your time and do it well. Many thanks again to Thomas Kreitlow for joining us on this episode of the podcast. You can find all the links to connect with him and all the links for Pulp Lifestyle by visiting our website at IamSaltLake.com forward slash 388. That's for episode 388. Hey, support for I Am Salt Lake comes from KRCL 90.9, amplifying community voices since 1979. This listener-supported music discovery station covers everything from reggae and punk rock to local grassroots activism. Listen today at 90.9 FM or online at krcl.org. And it is that time of the podcast where we give weekly recommendations. This is just something that we uh, we want to recommend to our listeners. Just something for fun. Right, something guys? we're enjoying, something right? Something we're enjoying or something that... Uh, we're dealing with. <laughs> yeah, something we're dealing with. Because that's like my recommendation. So my rec- yeah. recommendation this week is that ridiculous show Blippy. It is insane. Which is on Amazon. Mm-hmm. And I think you can YouTube it as well. But for some reason, Lucy loves Blippy. So... You know, I hate being that dad that just sticks her in front of the TV, but sometimes it's nice. Like if I have a podcast to edit or if I have some dishes to wash. Right. I mean, we run out of energy. And she just loves Blippi, which you would think she wouldn't because he usually has trucks and police cars. It's quote unquote boy stuff, but she loves it. It's fantastic. So check that out. And he's weird. So whatever. (laughs) What is your recommendation, Chrissy? My recommendation this week, I finally went and ate at Five Brothers Sushi. It is downtown Salt Lake City. They're actually attached to a karaoke bar and they have an area inside where you can go play Smash Brothers. So like if you want to go have sushi and you want to drag your kids, go there, put them in front of Smash Brothers and have some delicious sushi. Very cool. Very cool. Hey, and it is the first episode of July and that means that we give a uh, a shout out and some thanks to our Patreon supporters. These are uh, our listeners that are donating $1, $2, $10, some of them even $25 a month to help keep this podcast going because we need all the help we can get, guys. You never know if a microphone goes bad, hosting, we need more web hosting, anything and everything. So many thanks to our Patreon supporters. If you would like to become a Patreon supporter, it is really, really easy. Just go to patreon.com slash I am Salt Lake and you could become a supporter for as little as $1. Just like uh, these really cool, awesome Patreon supporters like John Miller. We got uh, Copeland. That's all they put down is Copeland. They're a new supporter. Um, Todd Bjorkland. Tim Haran, Wendy Joe Bradshaw, Nicole Davison, Alex Santi, Riley Padilla, Brandon Hill from Mountain Standard Time Marketing, Will Dugdale, Brittany Hemingway, Jeff Hadfield, Michael Beck, Eric Tamaro, Jeff Hatt, Sana, Alan Martindale, Nick Naylor, Brett Schmidt, Three Irons SLC, Nikki Line, Michelle Stevens Williams, Dirt in Your Skirt Podcast, Christopher A. Heiser, and Jay Chambers. Hey, if you want to become a supporter, patreon.com slash I am Salt Lake and your support will be very much appreciated. Thank you so much to our uh, our Patreon supporters. And that's gonna do it for this episode. Don't forget to support our show sponsors, Mark Miller Subaru, The Salt Lake Barber Company, KRCL, and especially for you, your downtown florist. We'll have links for all of them at our website under the notes for this episode, which you can find at IamSaltLake.com. Hey, and while you're on our website, make sure to check out our back catalog. We have close to 400 episodes right there on the website. You can listen to them right there online. You can share them right there from the website. 
There's links to connect with everybody that's been on the show. So make sure to uh, dig through some of that back catalog while you're on our website. And if you ever want to send us anything, you can always send letters, postcards, or packages to P.O. Box 4412, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84110. You have a great week. Make sure to get out and enjoy Salt Lake City. Support local whenever possible. And we'll see you on the next episode. And good night, Grammy. 